Hello, we're going to evaluate an elevator recording, or at least at least a simple one. And I'm opening up the EVA 625 analysis tool software. And I'm going to look at an older recording that I've been using for years. <coughs> and here what we see is, is a typical elevator recording. We have four windows. Upper window is sound level at every point in time. X axis or front to back, depending on how you put the instrument on the floor of the car. And then that would be front to back vibration. Y would be side to side vibration. Z axis, Z axis is vertical vibration. Bottom scale is in terms of time. And zero seconds is the point at which I actually started recording. If you look at this, and let's follow along the z-axis, not much is happening here. This is where the door is actually closing. And then the lift starts moving. So we see increasing acceleration, period of constant acceleration. Acceleration drops off, we're moving at full speed. And beginning at deceleration, constant deceleration, that deceleration drops off and we're stopped. This is what an upgoing lift would look like because we see the initial acceleration is positive. From the vertical axis, we get velocity as a function of time, or at each point in time. And that's done by the integration of the vertical axis motion. So we see increasing velocity, reaches kind of a peak, and then it settles to full speed. And then you'll see the speed starts dropping off, and that corresponds with what's happening in the lower window. Just to get a, a feel for what, the, what we're looking at here, you'll see that the, the maximum velocity is about 2.57 meters per second and the V95, which is the sustained velocity, is 2.54. So here you actually see it over speeds and then it settles down to full speed and we're just moving along at constant speed. I'm just going to unzoom. Your controls are up here, sound, distance, velocity, acceleration, jerk. Right, these are the things that would show up in the upper window. So let's look along the x-axis and, and not knowing anything else, we see some things that stand out above the rest. Right? Here we see a pretty good size bump, if you will. And I'm, you can see the same thing, the y, but I'm just going to focus on this. But we see a bump, a bump, a bump, a bump. Right. Now, when we're looking at bumps, then we're really thinking about things that are location dependent, and because it's horizontal, location dependent within the hoist way. So if I want to find out where this occurred, and I'll put the distance up in the upper window, and if you can keep an eye on these numbers, right, the intersection of the distance curve in that vertical line is up about 12 meters. Next bump, up about 17 meters. Next bump, up about 22 meters. Next bump, up about 27 meters. So every five meters we see a bump. So that's kind of an indication that, that it is a rail joint because each rail length is five meters. So we're, we're doing what's called a time domain analysis of this to, to identify what the vibration may be. But realistically, this is the vibration that's sensed by the instrument. People feel vibration differently. And to get a picture of human response to vibration, we pass it through the ISO filter, which is specified within ISO 18738, and this is a human response filter. So vibration, as people, as the instrument feels, we pass it through the ISO filter, now we have a picture of vibration that corresponds to how a person feel, feels that vibration, such that an increase in vibration here corresponds to an increase in the perception of that vibration. Where we saw those bumps clearly sticking out are no longer there. We could spend our entire lives trying to identify all vibration, but realistically, from a ride quality standpoint, we want to identify the vibration that people feel. So in this case, this one is the one that's still standing out, and we're up about 12 meters, roughly. I might go just a little bit before that. 
So just somewhere around 12 meters. And that's where we would go in the hoist way if we wanted to solve this problem, right? And, and do an inspection. Now, if you look at this, ride quality is evaluated in terms of the maximum peak-to-peak -peak vibration. So this is a peak-to-peak, -peak, this is a peak-to-peak, peak-to-peak, peak to little ones, big ones, little ones, big ones. So the maximum is the worst case, and you'll see that it's marked by these crosses. Let me unzoom. I always go to Z minus to unzoom. And the worst case in the x-axis is 9.4. The A95, think of as the typical vibration, that's a level that covers 95% of all of these peak-to-peaks. So this is really not a vibration problem, but, the, but it does give you a way of evaluating it. The vertical axis is quite a bit more vibration, so the maximum is 19.6, and the A95 is about 14.3. We'll look at a different recording to get an evaluation of that. But that's... That's the basic approach in attacking it. Likewise, so the controls here are sound. Now we have sound level as a function of time. Ride quality is a measure of both vibration and sound level. Distance, where the car, where the lift is at every point in time. Velocity, speed of the car at every point in time. The acceleration as defined within the standard. So we see a maximum acceleration sustained acceleration, maximum deceleration, sustained deceleration. Jerk is not really a ride control metric. We only use jerk for evaluating certain things, but when we think of when we think of ride quality, don't think jerk, think of vibration. Okay. I'll lead on to another recording for which will give us a chance to use the FFT.